Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 697 of the podcast and it is Friday the 9th of June 2023 as I record this. In today's show, I'm talking to Thomas Umstadt Jr. about novel marketing and also Christian publishing, which are the topics of his two podcasts. And we have a fantastic wide ranging chat that you'll find useful regardless of what genre you write. So you can also be writing nonfiction and find it useful or whether you are a Christian or not, as Thomas gives some great advice from his many years in the business. We also talk about how to successfully pitch podcasts like our own and how to be a good guest. Both topics I also cover in my book, Audio for Authors, audiobooks, podcasting and voice technologies available on, you guessed it, my store, creativepenbooks.com and of course on all the usual stores in all the usual formats. So the interview with Thomas is coming up in the interview section. In publishing and book marketing, well, I don't have any specific news this week, but I do have something to consider that might help you navigate aspects of publishing and book marketing that kind of relates to the topic of today's show, but also maybe other aspects of life as well. I'm also going to give you an earworm if you are of a similar age to me. So I am 48. So I heard an American author this week talking about marketing, someone I admire very much, to be clear. He was talking about advertising outlay and specifically some of the risks he was taking in order to put more money into ads. Now, he didn't see these actions as risks, but rather ways to accelerate growth. But I perceive them as risks. And yes, these risks were driving incredible revenue. These actions, I I guess I should say, were driving incredible revenue. And they were attracting much opportunity and it was all going very well for this author. And I felt the rise of comparisonitis, which happens to me from time to time, as it does to us all. And comparisonitis uh, is that basically you compare yourself to this other author and you think, maybe if I did those things, I would have that type of success. And I wanted to talk about this because I know you have likely felt the same way at some point. We all compare ourselves to others and sometimes that can drive us towards the things we want. And so it is good comparisonitis and sometimes it can just make us feel bad until we really reflect on it. So I was reflecting on this. So as an example of good comparisonitis, back in 2007, I used to listen to Yarrow Starak on his show Entrepreneur's Journey, uh, which is now just Yarrow Starak uh, podcast, I think it's called now. And I learned about blogging and podcasting and internet business from Yarrow. And I could see that he had escaped the day job culture that I was very unhappy in. And by comparing myself to him, I was able to see the potential for change because I could see he was living the type of life I wanted. And uh, he was living this kind of laptop uh, business before (laughs) before it became normal. (laughs) And that drove me to learn how to do things differently and ultimately start this business and leave my job a few years later. Actually, Yarrow's been on this show several times and I've also been on his as a successful student. So that was pretty cool. So that kind of comparisonitis is helpful when you identify someone who is doing the things that you want to do and achieving the results you want to achieve and then you can model yourself on them. But it's important to work out whether you want that kind of success. And this is a tip from Honoré Corder, who has also been on the show several times. And she uh, told me this as we were chatting. I think it was after the last time she came on the show. So it wasn't actually recorded, but I, I wrote it down because it's, I think it's a brilliant way of putting it. So essentially, you can separate what people want as authors generally, perhaps in a wider sense, but certainly as authors into three different categories. Do you want freedom, fame, 
or fortune. Freedom, fame or fortune. Now, these words have uh, strong connotations for many people, positive and negative. So you will need to think quite deeply about this. You can think of some synonyms, if you like, for those words. But because <laughs> it's got the nice alliteration there with the F, uh, that's why I think it's quite memorable. Freedom, fame or fortune. So once you identify what you really want, which of those you want, and you will make different decisions depending on which of those you want, and there is no judgment. This is the important thing. There's no judgment as to what is the right thing to do. It's got to be the right thing for you. You can choose whatever you like. Then you can start to make decisions as to whether your comparisonitis is justified and whether you're you're willing to do whatever it takes to be successful in that area. Coming back to that author I was talking about, um, I think from his perspective, it's about fortune. Um, fortune might be too strong a word, but certainly uh, money. Um, and yeah, so for me, that's even though I like to make decent money, I don't make choices around fortune. <laughs> uh, so you can make decisions as to whether your comparisonitis is justified. Um, so for me, it's always been freedom. And if you've been listening to the show, you will know this. Freedom is my um, sort of my main value in life. And here's the earworm I promised you. So I still have two songs on my Spotify playlist from my teenage years. I mean, I have other ones, but these are the two that uh, sort of I, I do occasionally still listen to. First of all, I'm Free by the Soup Dragons from, guess the year, 1990. So I was 15 in 1990. So in our sort of mid-teenage years, I guess we all start thinking about the future, or at least I did. And that song made such an impact on me because I wasn't free to do what I want any old time. Uh, but that's what I uh, aimed to achieve. The other song is One Way by The Levelers from 1991. And there's only one way of life and that's your own. And freedom definitely has shaped many of my life decisions. For example, getting a consulting job out of university so I could be free from debt and have uh, more choices in my future to travel as much as I've always done, make choices around being physically out there doing things, to be happily child free, to be an indie author, to make choices as an author now that mean I keep my freedom. For example, not being in KU, not having employees, not taking on debt in order to grow. Uh, a lot of these things I choose in order to be more free. Also to invest as much as possible. And I do have a list of money books, the creativepen.com forward slash money books, which go into a lot of stuff around investment. Because I want to be free as I become older and I need other streams of income for that that are not based on my physical work. So I also focus every day on physical health. So this morning, for example, I walked 11k as part of getting to my gym and home again uh, in order and then did a weightlifting session. So this is quite a big chunk out of my day, which I do several times a week, but I'm pretty obsessed <laughs> with retaining my freedom later in life, uh, physical freedom too. And so I prioritize my health span and I support the charity Dignity in Dying. So I have the freedom to choose in the future. Obviously, things can happen where you lose this type of freedom <laughs> but uh, I do a, I make a lot of choices around that and again no value judgment here you make the choices you want to make um, in order to do the things that you value so my challenge to you today is what do you value and this is specifically as an author I realize some of you are going to say family family's the other f but no we're really talking about if we're talking about publishing and book marketing in this section, um, family is not <laughs> the reason you do things around book marketing. <laughs> so what are these things? What underlies your choices? Do you want freedom, fame or fortune as an author? And if you don't know which one you want, you need to get really honest about it because it will shape the choices you make. What are you willing to do to achieve success in that area? What are you willing to give 
up. And pe- some people say, oh, well, I want a bit of maybe two of those. Yeah, I quite like freedom and fortune. But I really think that the decisions you make are so different depending on which of these you want. Um, for example, you know, I have absolutely no desire to be um, Insta famous or TikTok famous or go viral or be on the BBC news or be on uh, be in, uh, in a magazine or whatever. Like fame has no interest for me. For- so that's definitely bottom. Fortune, I definitely have an interest there, but it's not my number one. Freedom is top. So for you, what order are those in? So you must make the choices you want to in order to achieve the goals you want to achieve. But coming back to comparisonitis, do not compare yourself to someone who has a different value to you. And you you might be wrong, but you know you have to evaluate what someone else values in order to make sure you're not comparing yourself to them. So yeah, I'm interested to know what you think about this. Tweet me at the creative pen with a double N, leave a comment on the blog or the YouTube channel, email me joanna at thecreativepen.com. I hope that question gets you thinking. So in personal news, I'm still iterating, I'm calling it now, through my next novel, Catacomb, which is kind of taken, like the movie Taken meets Beowulf in the catacombs under Edinburgh. And I know the shape of it now and the drafting is almost done, but this is quite different a different process as I'm sort of playing with AI tools and using GPT-4 for lots of things and other tools as well. And so I'm kind of learning a new creative process at the same time or as writing and wrangling the chaos that is discovery writing. So yeah, it's kind of co-writing. I'm iterating a lot, rewriting, reprompting, but it's certainly fun. So the aim is that Catacomb will go to my editor at the end of the month. So I am focusing on that as my primary creative thing this month. I'm also finally building a new Shopify store for my fiction for JF Pen, and I intend to launch Catacomb through that new store. I guess that will be towards the end of, of the summer. And I've been meaning to do this for a while, build a second store. Um, but the next launch gives me the impetus to do that. So um, I realise many people are like, oh my goodness, that's a lot of work. It is a lot of work, I can tell you that. But uh, for me, it's the right decision to separate my stores and as it always has been, to separate my brands. Although if you didn't know, I only did separate my brands in 2012, I think it was. I used to write my fiction also under Joanna Penn, but... I am a very different writer as Joanna Penn than I am as JF Penn. So I'm really happy to keep it separate. And coming back to marketing, as more and more marketing is done with AI, it helps if you have a more segregated audience. So having a different Shopify store will mean that the um, the pixel and all of that will be different and the um, conversion ads hopefully will work better. And yeah, so I'm really happy about having two brands and I'm aiming to kind of build my fiction side up as well on Shopify. Creative Pen Books, of course, is where everything is right now, but that will just be my uh, Joanna Pen stuff once I have built the new store. So on AI, I'm really really super encouraged by how many of you want to learn about how to use the various AI tools. And in fact, so many that I've added a new session to my live webinars. So I may, (laughs) I I think I'm probably a little bit mad because I wanted to keep the sessions at a manageable level so I can get to as many questions as possible. So uh, there are now five, (laughs) five separate webinars well I will deliver the same material five separate times and they are all in that last week of June the beginning of July so I um, so you can go to thecreativepen.com forward slash live l-i-v-e links in the show notes and I'll be giving a demo I'll, I'll first of all I'm going to go through a whole load of principles around thinking about AI and then I'm going to go into using the various tools chat GPT GPT-4 mid journey pseudo right and uh, po and and uh, others. So yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I will not be selling the sessions separately um, because things change so much. I may do some more depending on how well these go, but uh, uh, the ticket holders will get the recording. So even if you can't attend these live, if you get a ticket, you'll get the recording. So you can book a ticket at thecreativepen.com forward slash live and they are £75. 
I also talking about health, as I, I mentioned before, I'm pretty obsessed <laughs> with this. Uh, but I have an important book recommendation that I want you all to get or at least have a look at. And that is Built to Move. The 10 Essential Habits to Help You Move Freely and Live Fully by Kelly and Juliet Starrett. So that is Built to Move. So, and I uh, bought this in Kindle because I wanted to read it, but then I also ordered it in paperback and I've got it on my desk. I've got loads of little tabs on that. It's got image, you know, pictures of the various postures um, that you can do even during the day. So I'll get up and move around and do some of the stretches and, and some of these things. I increasingly find that the more I focus on physical health, movement, longer walking, my lifting workouts, getting outside, generally being a human in a physical body, not just a brain, then the better I feel. And of course, as the years march by, I want to do everything I can to have a longer health span and also creative life. And exercise is pretty much the number one thing you can do to improve your creativity. So yes, of course, we will all die. (laughs) <laughs> but let's be as fit and healthy as we can uh, as we are as authors and as we age. So hopefully we can prevent as much as possible from going wrong. Obviously, things happen. Life happens. Uh, and But we are authors who are sedentary in nature. And many of you will probably have an office job too, or a work at home job where you're sitting down like Jonathan and I. So uh, yeah, get this book Built to Move by Kelly and Juliet Starrett. So thanks for your emails and tweets and comments this week. As ever, Marion uh, Roach-Smith, fantastic interview, and many of you enjoyed it. Rob said, thank you so much for your interview with Marion. I've been thinking about writing a memoir for almost two years, but the topic is still very raw. And as you discussed, I fear the reaction being honest may produce. When Marion talked about writing the personal transcendent change in one's life, it crystallised for me what telling my story means to me and what it could mean to others. I think I know what argument I have to prove and it all comes down to a cuckoo clock. Thanks again for producing the most insightful podcast ever. Oh, I appreciate that, Rob. And I appreciate Marion. Uh, she is a very good interviewee and I very much enjoyed our chat and um, I'm glad it touched so many of you. James says, what a marvellous conversation. Isn't it strange how things work out in this writing gambit? After writing a fantasy series and a standalone, I've just finished a memoir today. And until I listened in, I didn't even realise it was memoir. (laughs) The healing pond is about building a swimming pond when snapping my Achilles heel and finding a new way of looking after myself, personal responsibility. This sent me on a great journey as you went on with pilgrimage. And at just over 32,000 words, it's easily the shortest book I've written, easily the hardest and taken me the longest to write. Thanks. What a wonderful guest and immaculate timing. And yes, as I discussed with Pilgrim, with Marion about pilgrimage, it, it is it's it's not super super short, but it's shorter than I expected. And I cut out like tens of tens of thousands of words, and also the hardest and yeah, gr- grueling but important. I think that's probably what we can say with memoir. Very interesting that James didn't realise he was writing a memoir until the interview. So that is interesting. And finally, Karen Wyatt, who has been on this show and on Books and Travel before, said, this was a fantastic interview. I'm inspired by the reminder that readers want to learn about the author's transcendent arc and what helped them get there. I'll use this to structure my own writing. Thank you both. So fantastic. You can tweet me at The Creative Pen. Send me pictures of where you're listening. I haven't had some pictures lately. Uh, Email me, joanna at thecreativepen.com or leave a comment on the blog or the YouTube channel. I love to hear from you. It makes this more of a conversation. So today's show is sponsored by Kobo Writing Life, Kobo's free, fast and easy self-publishing platform. KWL was built by authors for authors and their team of dedicated book lovers is always working hard to help you reach new readers around the world. Kobo's author first approach is one of the reasons they developed a promotions tool. Yes, this is a book marketing episode. This is an easy and affordable way for you to market your book directly to Kobo readers. They offer lots of promotions that don't require you to drop your price because they know when you're publishing wide, it can be a pain to coordinate pricing across multiple retailers. 
Any promotions listed as a percent off, for example, a 40% VIP sale, mean you don't have to change your price as the discount will be provided by promo code at checkout. If that sounds good to you, keep an eye out for percentage off promotions and buy more, save more sales, where you can submit your titles and leave the rest to Kobo. And if you're taking part in a promotion, be sure to tell your readers all about it. The promotions tool is updated on a weekly basis, so make sure you're taking a regular look to see what's on offer and if there's an opportunity that matches your books and marketing plans. And on a personal note, I go into the KWL promotions uh, tool every three weeks. I have a reminder in my calendar. I go in and I pretty much enter every single thing I can and a whole load of them are not accepted, but some are and those promotions pretty much drive a lot of my sales at Kobo. And they also have promotions for audiobooks too, if you do audiobooks through Kobo. If you're a KWL author and don't yet have access to the promotions tool, email the team at writinglife at kobo.com and they'll enable this for you. If you want to learn more about KWL, check out the Kobo Writing Life podcast, available wherever you are listening to this, and find them on social media. You can create your free account today at kobo.com forward slash writing life. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time in creating the show is sponsored by my wonderful patrons, especially the extra in between episodes on AI and other futurist topics. I'm especially grateful to those patrons who've been supporting the show for years and months and weeks. You are all fantastic. It demonstrates you find the show useful and want it to continue as we approach episode 700. (laughs) It's nice to know you want it to continue. So thanks to new and returning patrons this week. Quinn Ward, Chally D, Shirley Day, JJ Johnson, Thomas Noss, Jimmy Kepler and Reagan Teller. And if you support the show on Patreon, you'll get my extra monthly Q&A for patrons only, which I will be doing, I guess, probably next week, Uh, certainly in the next couple of weeks. And I answer your questions about writing craft, publishing, book marketing, making money with your writing and AI and futurist stuff. You can support the show with just a few dollars or euros or pounds or many other currencies and you'll get the extra monthly Q&A plus the backlist of many years worth of audio if you would like lots more. You can support the show at patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, let's get into the interview. Thomas Umstadt Jr. is the CEO of AuthorMedia.com, an award-winning professional speaker, non-fiction author, and host of the Novel Marketing Podcast and the Christian Publishing Show. So welcome to the show, Thomas. Thanks, Joanna. It's great to be here. Oh, yes. It's exciting to talk to you. But first up, tell us a bit more about you and how you got into writing and podcasting and now running a business for writers. Yeah, so back when I was in college, I started writing a book, as many college students do, and I went to a writer's conference to sell my book, and I was in the marketing session, and the lady speaking was like, you got to start a blog, you got to have a website, and all of the authors you know, were terrified. I'm like, how do I do that? Well, I've been building websites since I was a kid, <laughs> so I met a real author there at this conference, and I was like, well, I'll build you a website for free, no problem, and So I built her website and she told all of her friends and I started charging them. And pretty soon I was going to conferences and selling websites because everybody was interested in my websites. (laughs) None of the agents were particularly interested in my book at the time. And so by the time I graduated from college, I had started a website business. And at our peak, we had 12 people building websites for authors all over the world. And we built the My Book Table plugin to help make our websites better. We eventually allowed sold that to people who weren't buying websites from us. Anybody could use that plugin to add books to their website. And so my way into the publishing space was actually from like the technical side. I was the nerd at the conference who would give the tech talks <laughs> mm. rather than on teaching on craft or something like that. But you have got books, right? Tell us about these. I do. So I wrote a blog post about dating and relationships that went viral. It got a million views in around a month. And a lot of the people reading that article wanted me to write a book about it. I was like, I don't know if I want to write a book. I've been working with authors for years at this point, and I knew how much work it was. But 
So I, I, I thought I got out of it by calling everyone's bluff. And I said, all right, if you raise $10,000 on Kickstarter, then I'll write the book. So I put the book on Kickstarter and they raised $10,000. So I was like, well, I guess I have to become an author now. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I wrote the book and it ended up having a big impact. And I'm glad I did it. But it, yeah, writing a book's a lot of work. I have a lot of respect for authors who are willing to walk that journey. Mm, well, it's so interesting you say that because you and I are also podcasters. You have two shows. I have had two shows, but I've cut back on my second show. But you've been podcasting on novel marketing since 2013, so a decade now. <laughs> and you said that it's a lot of work to write a book, but a decade of podcasting is a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess, why did you decide to get into podcasting then? It's interesting because the reason I got into it was to help sell websites, but it turned out I really enjoyed podcasting. And so I don't build websites anymore. I've spun off that business and sold the plugin business. And now the podcasting is the business. I just do the podcast and courses. And I always loved listening to talk radio as a kid and being able to talk into a microphone and to teach online, either through courses or through a podcast, is really enjoyable for me. I love that aha experience that people have. And so, yes, podcasting is a lot of work and it's become even more work. As you know, as you raise the production values of your podcast, you have a bigger team and there's more cost and more labor that goes into it. But it's worth it in the end. The end product, I feel like, is, is worth all of the work. That's so funny because it's just me right now. And then I use some AI tools and then I have one VA who does the blog post, the show notes. But I've actually reduced. I don't really have a team anymore. <laughs> so I've gone the other way. It's so interesting you say that. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we all use the tools we want to use. But I do want to come to the topics on the Novel Marketing Podcast, although I feel like you do cover things for fiction and nonfiction authors. A lot of marketing crosses both. But what are some of the fundamentals of marketing fiction that have remained important over the decade? Yeah, it's interesting because you and I have both been doing this long enough to see fads come and go and often come back. It's like launch bonuses. We've seen that come into fashion, go out of fashion, come back into fashion. And so it's interesting, like what has stayed effective for this whole time? And I would say the most important thing is writing books that readers want to read. And a lot of authors see marketing as this thing that you add to a book at the last minute so that it can find its audience. It's like sugar that you sprinkle on the top of a cookie. And if you really want people to eat the cookie, if you really want people to read the book, you need to bake the sugar into the cookie. <laughs> the cookie itself has to taste good. You need to write a book that resonates with readers, which means knowing who your readers are and crafting the book to be the kind of book that they not only want to read, but want to share with their friends. I would say in terms of marketing, and that's like, if you don't do that, none of the other things matter because mm -hmm. um, if the, you can't fix a bad book with good marketing and you can't spend, there's no amount of money that you can spend to make people want a book that they don't want. You can't change other people. This is useful knowledge for a marriage, but it's also useful knowledge for a marketer. <laughs> it's like, that's not our job. Our job is not to change people into the kind of people who like the book we wrote. Our job as a writer is to write the kind of book that people already like. It's much easier to change your book than it is to change another human being or tens of thousands of human beings. But the probably... The most powerful technique back when I first got started was having an email list. And the most powerful technique now is having an email list. Yay! <laughs> like that <laughs> has not changed. And I was a marketer, marketing director for a publishing company for a time in, in the midst of the podcast. I was still doing the podcast, but a, a publishing company brought me in. And that was a really great experience because, because I had access to all of their marketing data. So I'm approaching it as a marketer and I'm doing all of these experiments and I learned some things that kind of blew my mind. One was that Facebook did not move the numbers. Facebook activity didn't sell books at all. And this was back in 2015, 2016, when Facebook was still, people thought it worked. And I was like, I'm not seeing these Facebook promos moving the sales needles at all. Uh, and the other thing that we saw was that email really did. <laughs> mm -hmm. An author with an email list sold so many more books than an author without an email list, especially at launch which then gives them that momentum to carry through often for months ahead of time. And mm. I would say probably the next most important thing, again, that hasn't changed is owning your own platform. 
So if you're a chicken, the food is free at the chicken coop. But the reason the food is free at the chicken coop is because you are the product being sold. So if you're unhappy with Facebook, there's no one to talk to because you're not the customer of Facebook. You are the product that Facebook is selling to somebody else. They're selling your attention. They're selling your time to advertisers. And if you want to have effective marketing, you need to be willing to be the customer to pay. And in Facebook, we'll talk to you. If you spend enough money on advertising at Facebook, suddenly you get a contact person. <laughs> you get a, a customer success manager or an advertising consultant. And it, the whole game changes. So I'm not saying that Facebook advertising should be the tactic for you. But if you want to be effective in your marketing, you need to see it as something you spend money on rather than just time. The idea that, oh, I can create funny memes and share them on social media and that will make me famous. That's I just have not seen anyone show numbers that that is the case. That's so interesting because, again, you and I are podcasters. And... This is content that takes time, doesn't cost that much money, takes, you know, time is money, but it is a very different form of marketing to Facebook ads. And I've been hot and cold on Facebook ads for a long time and have recently <laughs> gone back into it because I now I have my own store, creativepenbooks.com, <laughs> and conversion ads with Shopify and Meta, Facebook, it actually is is like something entirely new because we're never able to do conversion ads with Amazon or any other place. So it, but you really talked there about if you're going to do the marketing, you need to pay, but you and I are both using content marketing for, I guess, non-fiction based businesses. What are your thoughts on content? I mean, I agree with you in terms of the don't bother posting memes on Facebook or whatever um, in terms of selling books, but is there a case for content marketing for fiction? There can be. Podcasting is interesting because it's a very deep medium of communication, right? Your listeners have your voice in their head more most weeks than they have their own mother's voice in their head, right? Like that's a really powerful <laughs> place of influence. Yeah. Like, how, you know, and, and you're listening right now. You're like, is that true? Like, when was the last time you called your mom? How long did you talk to her? How much time do you spend listening to Joanna Penn? Right. That's an incredibly deep source of connection, but it's not super wide. Podcasting is the least viral of all of the mediums. It's, it's hard to share. You have some great quote, and I want to share it with a friend. There's not really a good, easy way to do it. Sure, there's some tools. If someone's really tech savvy, they can clip the audio and send it, but then they have to... The person well, even I don't do that. Too much yeah, hassle. <laughs> it, it's way too much hassle. And so it's uh, when somebody starts listening to a podcast, they tend to keep listening, but it doesn't spread very much. Whereas the blog version of your podcast is much more shareable. You send an email, you can copy that link and send it to a friend. And so podcasting is for deepening the relationship. It's an engagement tool. It's not a very good attraction tool. So if you think of marketing, you have kind of three phases. You have attracting, engaging, and converting, getting people to know who you are, like you, and trust you. Those are the three steps. And when uh, I'm kind of troubleshooting an author's marketing, often the first thing we're trying to figure out is, where is it breaking down? And for most authors, their challenge is in that first step, the attraction step. People don't know who they are. If they did, they would like them. Wow, you have a great podcast or wow, you have a great book. But getting the word out in the first place is the challenge. And that tends to be the most cash expensive mechanism. There are free ways to do it, right? I'm not paying you to come on your podcast and some mm. people are hearing my name for the first time. So guesting on podcasts can be effective, writing Guest blog posts can be effective, and, and it can be effective for novelists. There's more podcasts focused on specific genres now, which is what the super fans listen to. The kind of fans taking risks on new authors and new books are listening to a book or a podcast about military science fiction or Amish fiction or, or whatever the micro genre is, right? If you can be a guest on that podcast, it can help introduce you to a new vibrant audience of potential super fans. Mm. It's interesting. You mentioned military sci-fi. It made me think of um, my husband listens to a lot of podcasts, as do I. And he now, is now listening to Jack Carr's podcast. And this is um, he's a military thriller author, ex-military, actually ex-military. And he's interviewing other people who were our military writing books, fiction and nonfiction. And I thought that was really interesting because this guy's a really big name thriller author in the niche. And yet he's doing a podcast which is around his 
author brand as such that also relates to his fiction, which I thought was really interesting. And it's what I kind of tried to do with books and travel, which is interview people who use places in their in their novels and their nonfiction, but it morphed into more of a travel thing for travel (laughs) people. So I kind of got that wrong. And when I was thinking about this idea of podcasting for fiction, I was thinking around, is it best to go after the nonfiction themes that lie beneath your novels? So for me, it's religion, history, European culture, that kind of thing. I had Jack Carr's gone after military and that could have been military sci-fi, but it's actually for him military thriller, not military romance or anything like that. So what do you think about that kind of idea? Like what are the themes, the nonfiction themes beneath our fiction? It can work. And the question determining whether it will work for you and for your genre is, does my genre have an otaku? So this is a Japanese term for like somebody who's obsessed with something. It's like fan, but like stronger than fan. So the classic example that Seth Godin shares in, I forget which book, but he talks about how hot sauce in America has new taku, right? There's hot sauce magazines. There are hot sauce TV shows or or YouTube channels. People are really into hot sauce. There is no ketchup. (laughs) Otaku. (laughs) Ketchup's very popular. In fact, arguably, ketchup is more popular than hot sauce on a per ounce or per kilogram basis, except everybody just eats Heinz ketchup. (laughs) Like like everybody's (laughs) got the same ketchup. And so if you wanted to uh, do something around ketchup, people are like, oh, that's boring. But if you're going to be like, I'm going to have a podcast about the spiciest hot sauces in the world. And if you can eat them while answering interview questions, right, you'll get millions of views. (laughs) It, on on so, YouTube. You should that on one YouTube. should be on YouTube for sure. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it exists. It's called the hot ones. He gets celebrities on and he tortures <laughs> them with hot spicy wings and then asks them uh hot questions and you'll get to watch famous people cry. It's 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 quite fun. <laughs> but that show wouldn't work if they were eating ketchup. And the same is true with certain genres. So some genres they just don't have that kind of fan base. You know, people buy them and read them, but they do it quietly. They don't talk to each other about that genre. And also does that genre connect well with the nonfiction topic? So an area where it does work well is uh, Christian books, Christian nonfiction, Christian fiction. C.S. Lewis, you know, one of the most famous Christian authors, he writes a book, Mere Christianity. He makes the case that Jesus is either Lord, he's a liar, or he's a lunatic. And then he writes Narnia, where Lucy comes back from Narnia and tells everyone about Narnia. And the professor says, well, Lucy's either lying She's crazy, or she's telling the truth about Narnia, right? He's taking that same nonfiction argument straight from his nonfiction book and embedding it into his fiction book. And they both support each other, both in a marketing way and in a messaging way. That's great. Well, let's come to the Christian publishing because you also host the Christian publishing show. And some people might be Christians listening, but might not publish Christian books. And then there's people like me. I'm not a Christian, but I have a master's in theology and pretty much all my fiction has religious elements, a lot of religious history, Christian in particular, as well as my recent memoir, which is called Pilgrimage. So one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you was about this Christian publishing need. So what are the hallmarks of Christian publishing and what are the kinds of genres that sit within that fiction and nonfiction? So Christian publishing and Christian books are different from other genres in a very interesting way. So back in the 1950s, the big publishers stopped publishing Christian books, 1950s, 1960s, and a lot of the bookstores stopped carrying Christian books. And so the reaction of of Christians, particularly evangelical Christians and conservative Christians in the United States, was to create their own bookstores and their own publishing companies and even their own distribution companies. And so Christian books, while they look like a book like any other book in terms of like size and printing and technology, they're in almost this like parallel universe of distribution channels, retailers, all the way up to the publishers. And in that way, they're more like comic books, which are the same, right? Comic books have their own printers. They have their own stores. I don't know how it is in the UK, but here in the States, you go to a comic book store and it doesn't have any normal books, <laughs> but it might sell <laughs> Magic the Gathering or it might sell Warhammer figurines and there's tables to play board games and there's all these comic books to buy. And it's its own subculture, 
right? The, somebody mm-hmm. might spend $50 a month at a comic book store and no money at a Barnes & Noble or on Amazon on traditional books. And Christian publishing, when we say Christian publishing, what we're referring to is that kind of conservative evangelical side of publishing that got kicked out in the 50s and 60s. Now, what's interesting is that with the left behind books in the 90s, they were brought back in. <laughs> so the left behind books sold a billion dollars worth of books. In a I, I was one of those readers. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and not only did bookstores, were they happy to carry left behind and give them prominent feature, but even Walmart would sell left behind books. <laughs> They'd have a big bin of left behind books in the 90s. And so then Christian books got kind of invited back into the mainstream a little bit. And so there's actually fewer Christian bookstores now than there were back in the 90s, because there's no way for an independent bookstore to be able to compete with Walmart if Walmart's cherry picking the most popular books. It it just doesn't work that way. And so the subculture, the readership is still separate. So if you want to write for that quote unquote Christian market, you're not actually writing for Christians in the sense of like people who assent to Christian views. What you're really writing to are those conservative kind of holiness minded Christians that are a little bit separate. They tend to be, and again, they're marketing generalizations, not universal observation, Mm, but they tend to be more rural, more small town, maybe some in the suburbs, but the kind of the farther away from the city centers a little bit less sophisticated with technology, a little bit less online. So if you're really trying to target them, they're not as online. They're not super online all the time. In fact, the biggest force in Christian publishing right now in terms of book sales are homeschool book fairs, which are these kind of rolling book fairs that will move from town to town. And authors will go to these book fairs once they've established a reputation. And it's not uncommon for an author to sell ten, twenty thousand. dollars $30,000 worth of books over a weekend, cash on the barrel. This is not mm-hmm. tracked by book scan. The, you know, the MPD group doesn't know these numbers. <laughs> it's just handing cash for a book or swiping a square credit card. And it's not just books for kids. It's this whole community of conservative homeschoolers who are creating books for each other and buying those books in very large numbers. And the authors who are big in that world, often people don't even know who they are, but they're making in some cases, millions of dollars a year, reaching this very different, very separated target market. Yeah, it's so interesting to hear that. And as I said, I did read those Left Behind series. And I think the spiritual warfare books were what kind of brought me into writing the types of books I do now (laughs) and why I think about angels and demons and all of that, because that's what I, as a teenager, that's what I was reading about basically fighting. So to me, I mean, they're on Amazon, they're talking about sort of the online bookstores. There are categories of things like Christian fantasy. I don't know where Left Behind sits, but I realised that, um, well, no, I mean, that that is Christian fantasy, right? The Left Behind series, or is it post-apocalyptic Christian fantasy because... (laughs) The rapture hasn't happened and that's what the books are based on. But just coming back to the genres, so what sort of genres sit within that? Or And even now, can people sell online as well? Yeah, so that's what's interesting now that, because it used to be Christian bookstores would screen and they would make a decision what is and is not a Christian book, All right, You could call yourself a Christian book, but if the bookstores don't stock you, then you're not a Christian book. And it gave companies like Lifeway a lot of influence. But on Amazon, anybody can put their book into a Christian category. And there's actually Alex Newton with Kalytics had, I was working with him to add a report for Christian books, and he had to go a whole level deeper in his analytics because a lot of the Christian categories on Amazon are five subcategories down, right? Mm. Religion and spirituality, colon, Christian, colon, fiction. And then there's dozens or hundreds of subcategories underneath that. And many of them are genres that exist in the general market, right? So there's Christian fantasy, but there's also regular fantasy. But there is one genre that's a uniquely Christian genre, and that's Amish, which is a very big genre in the United States. Millions of copies sold every year. And that is a uniquely Christian genre. There may be some secular authors who started writing in Amish. 
and what's interesting is that these are not books by the Amish or for the Amish. Yeah, I was going <laughs> to say, because they're not very technological. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I can explain real quick why Amish is really popular. And mm. I think this helps understand how to write books that people want to read. Because if you understand the pain that somebody has that your book is addressing, your book will be far more resonant. So there's this concept that was developed in the 1970s called future shock, which is like culture shock, but in your own culture, where everything's changing so quick around you that it's disorienting and everything is really different. And we've been experiencing future shock, right? The old people are constantly complaining about, you know, back when I was a kid, things were different. Um, but that's a real psychological pain. And if somebody's experiencing that pain, an Amish book, which takes place in a world where nothing ever changes is a kind of a beautiful respite. It's a break from the frenetic pace of technological and cultural change. And that's why that genre isn't a fad. It's been around for 10, 20 years at this point. And it's because it's touching that point of pain, that future shock pain. And so this is a, once you understand, oh, there are psychological pains that cause people to want to read. Once you can identify that for your reader and in your genre, suddenly going back to what we talked about at the beginning, you've written a book that people want to read and won't shut up about because they're like, oh my goodness, I was in pain in this way. And they may not articulate it consciously, but now I read this book and it made me feel better, right? I was depressed and this book made me feel encouraged. I was hopeless and the book gave me hope, right? Whatever it is that your book touches on, once you can put your finger on the pain, suddenly your book becomes alive for that reader. Yeah, it's interesting. I I really also started writing thrillers as well. I started reading thrillers when I was really miserable in my corporate job, and I, I just wanted to escape. I wanted something fast moving that I could escape into, and I really love explosion movies and all that kind of thing. So, <laughs> I don't know. Is that the same thing as what you're saying? The psychological pain, or could you give some more examples? Because I think people will be interested. Yeah, that's exactly it. So, somebody who's bored may look to thrillers for some adventure. Um, fantasy is often really popular. People who are struggling with mental illness, not that everyone who reads fantasy is, has mental illness, but particularly depression and anxiety. It's really encouraging to read stories of people who have hope, who are making a difference, who are acting and who are doing scary things, right? What's the quintessential element of fantasy is big monsters, big bad guys that get defeated in the end, right? You don't read an epic fantasy to find out how it ends. You know that the bad guy is going to get defeated in the end. And you want to, but you read it because you want to spend time in that world. You want to spend time escaping from the world that you're in, the mundane or the boring or the stressful, and spend time in Middle Earth or spend time in Hogwarts or whatever that world is. And the different worlds will resonate with different people differently. But yes, every single, I actually have a whole episode kind of breaking down different genres and why people read that genre and like the social triggers psychologically that cause them to want to read that genre. Because, and I just barely scratched the surface because every genre has a reason why people want to read that kind of book. And some genres go in and out of fashion, which is really fascinating. It's like Westerns, aren't nearly as popular now as they were 50 years ago, 70 years ago. And so that's fascinating for me as a marketer and also as a reader to watch those trends, but also to ask that question of like, what is it about this book that makes people want to read it? Because it's really easy to be like, oh, people who read that kind of fiction, they're crazy. <laughs> and like, that's really intellectually lazy. They're not crazy. They're just different. And if we can understand how they're different, we can understand the world a little bit better. Mm, absolutely. Well, then an interesting question with book marketing in the last sort of six months, what we've seen is the removal, coming back to Meta, Facebook and some of the other ads, the removal of things like religious preference or um, religious orientation, sexual orientation, gender, a whole lot of things have been removed from our targeting in various advertising mediums because of Apple's privacy changes which is kind of interesting in many ways. In some ways, it's really great because it means more privacy. And in other ways, as marketers, it's difficult because I thought, well, Christians like pilgrimage. I met loads of Christians. I'll see if any Christians like my memoir, Pilgrimage. And I wasn't able to use that as a preference. So what are your thoughts on other ways if we want our books to reach people who are Christian? Is it a case of like on Amazon keywords or other keywords or what are your recommendations there? Yeah, they're kicking us out again, right? Christians are specifically discriminated against on Facebook. If you write a romance, you can target similar romances to your book. But if you write a Christian romance, 
you can't. <laughs> to like, be fair, it's not just Christians; it's all religion. <laughs> that's true. All but different there, religions. <laughs> that's true, but the, but the other religions don't have a genre attached to them, and you can have, say, Muslim elements in your romance, and you can target other romances that have Muslim elements because they're not published by a Muslim publisher, and so there, it is, in a sense, kind of uniquely targeting. Christians, you can't target like Muslims as a John as a category, but you could target books potentially that have Muslim elements in it. And what's interesting is it's constantly changing because there are like certain keywords or certain brands that a lot of Christians will like that some authors will target. So like Hobby Lobby is really hot right now. So Hobby Lobby is a craft store in the United States, but it's one that's very popular with Christians. And so Christian authors will target fans of Hobby Lobby. (laughs) But you're also grabbing people who are in fan of quilting and maybe they're not a Christian. They just, they like Hobby Lobby on Facebook. And so you have to start thinking outside of social media. And I will say starting in 2016, Christians often started pivoting off of social media, and especially starting in 2020, it was very clear we weren't very welcome, especially to have conversations about Christian topics. And so a lot of the online conversation has moved to invite only smaller telegram signal and to a lesser extent discord channels. So it's not that Christians aren't on Facebook, they're still still there. But a lot of the conversation and a lot of the time has moved off of Facebook. And so it's not as effective of a tool, even if you could target them. But you can still use Amazon ads. So Amazon will let you target Christian keywords and be related product on Christian books. And so it's not like all of the tools are turned off, but Facebook particularly has become pretty hostile to any kind of Christian marketing. You really have to kind of be really clever (laughs) and box it (laughs) and trick it into placing your ads in front of your audience. Yeah, I must say with my book title, Pilgrimage is a pretty keyword specific book. So (laughs) it's been very interesting who's been finding it. But our titles can have different words. I mean, some of my book titles are the same as the Left Behind titles because there's some really good words that tap into some religious themes and stuff like that. We mentioned email before. What about the big email list stuff? I mean, things like BookBub and other email list sort of marketing things. Is that something that you think is still worth doing? It is. And it still works for Christians. BookBub has at least one, if not multiple Christian categories. I think it has a a Christian nonfiction category and at least one Christian fiction category. And that responds really well. Uh, Christian podcasting is actually really vibrant. There's more Christian podcasts than any other kind of podcast Mm. by a large margin. So if you look at the chart of podcasts per category, religion, spirituality, colon, Christianity has, last I looked at the numbers, like twice as many podcasts as the next most popular category. You know, why is that? It's like, well, every church puts their and sermons on as a podcast so that the child care workers can listen to the sermon later oh, on right. during the okay. week. And so mm-hmm. there's you know, that thousands, millions of churches that have a small podcast feed in addition to a lot of standalone Christian podcasts. And so it's actually a really powerful mechanism that is completely outside of social media control because nobody controls podcasting. It's a technology, not a company. And so it's a censorship resistant, as we like to say in podcasting. And not only that, but a lot of Christians learned how to subscribe to a podcast to get their church's sermon podcast, right? They're sick or they can't go to church on Sunday, so they download the episode on a podcast. And so and both guesting on Christian podcasts, but also advertising on Christian podcasts can be very effective. Email still very effective. It's very forwardable because Christians live in communities. So if you can get one person in a church to like your book, there's a chance they'll tell all their friends at your church, at their church about your book. And so there's still virality, especially if you bake it into the book itself, you put elements into the book we're talking about, people will talk about the book. So you still can do it. But you kind of have to set aside the sort of techniques that work for genres that target very online people, at least Mm. to a certain degree. I love that. In fact, I was just thinking there about, I mean, I guess also Christians who go to a church that does sermons every week, which is, I guess, most churches, (laughs) people are used to listening to someone talking about a theme for a certain amount of time, which really suits the podcast format. So I can see why people would want to go and listen either, obviously, to their own pastor, but also to other people's 
churches. I mean, they might want to go listen to a sermon on a particular topic or Bible verse or something. So I can see actually why this is so good. But I did want to ask you, therefore, if there are Christians or other people listening who would like to pitch Christian podcast or any podcast, in fact, you and I both get tons of pitches. So what are your tips for pitching a podcast, especially for fiction authors in particular? The most important tip is to listen to the podcast before sending your pitch. I know it's time (laughs) consuming, but Joanna, you probably get 99 pitches for every one that for everyone you say yes oh, to yeah maybe and more than ridiculous, that ridiculous ridiculous yeah. number yeah. And, and the key to fishing is that the bait needs to fit the fish right if you're trying to catch a catfish you're going to use different bait than if you're trying to catch a salmon and and the only way that you can adapt your pitch to the podcast is to have listened to that podcast first and It's very obvious getting a pitch that they have no idea what the podcast is about, that whoever did this just got a list of podcasts on publishing or whatever, and then they're sending the same pitch to all the podcasts and just swapping out the name or sometimes not even swapping out the name. Right? So somebody sent me a pitch this just the last week and they're like, I really like your podcast. And it had some other podcast name. It's like, this is a copy and paste (laughs) fail right here. And there's this idea of like, well, if I just do it enough, some of the podcasts will say yes. And What you'll end up doing that way is getting kind of the most obscure, the smallest podcasts that maybe no one's ever pitched before. Those might actually say yes to you. And there is some advantage to going on a very new or very small podcast because it gives you a chance to practice on a new audience. But it's not going to be effective in reaching a large audience because the podcast is new. It has a small audience. And so listen to the episode first and then listen for how that podcast host is trying to thrill their audience. And then when you craft your pitch, you craft it in such a way where you ex- you kind of demonstrate, hey, I know who you are. I know who your audience is. I know what your audience wants, and I can help you give them that. And if you craft your pitch that way, suddenly people are like, oh, thank you. I needed a guest for Thursday (laughs) and you (laughs) would be a good fit, but you have to actually, you have to do the work to demonstrate that you're a good fit. They're not going to spend 30 minutes researching you to see if you're a good fit. You've got to do that work yourself. The value to the audience is always so important. And as you say, we both get pitched for like ridiculous things, like a credit card thing. I was like, really? Why? Why are you doing that? Or someone who says, oh, I watched your podcast of this interview and I watched the video of it and it was amazing. And I'm like, yeah, there was no video. So <laughs> you, <laughs> you just blatantly lied. But yeah, I mean, that's the thing. The scattergun approach doesn't work. But let's say you do, someone listening does a pitch, they get an interview what is what is the best way to deliver value to the host and the audience well, the first thing i recommend is to buy a good microphone because you as the guest you are half maybe more depending on the format of the show of the audio quality so if you come to that podcast with bad audio you are lowering the overall audio quality of the podcast significantly and It's no longer expensive to get a good microphone. It used to be. Back when we were starting, Joanna, there was was not a lot of microphones available, and the ones that were available weren't very good. Back 10 years ago, the Blue Yeti was considered a good microphone. It's not a good microphone. But back in 2012, it was, you know, pretty good. It was maybe the second or third best microphone. Now there's probably 30 microphones better, and in some cases, cheaper. Can I just ask you that? What microphone do you use? So, well, I use the um, Shure SM7B. It's a, it's a very expensive microphone. This isn't the microphone I recommend for an author getting started. For somebody getting started, I recommend the Samson either Q2U, which is a $20 microphone. It looks like a stage mic. Or for $100, you can get the Q9U, which looks like a podcast microphone. It's a dynamic microphone. It's blind to room noise and road noise, unlike the Yeti, which is very sensitive to room noise and road noise. And you don't have to treat your room if you're using a Q9U or really any dynamic microphone. But what's nice about the Q9U is that not only is it a dynamic microphone, but it's a dynamic microphone with USB. So you can plug it directly into your computer. And it also has XLR. So if down the road you want to get a mixer or a board and get a fancy setup, you don't have to throw away your microphone. It can scale with you. And let's say someday you do want to get the SM7B, which is the $400 
microphone that all the big podcasters use. Well, you can then put that Q9U as your backup microphone for your guest, right? You can still use it. So it's a purchase that scales really well. I'm still using a Blue Yeti (laughs) (laughs) for both this podcast and my audiobooks. (laughs) So I would say that there you can make the most of any equipment, but as we established earlier, you do have a higher quality production than I do. <laughs> and to be fair, I didn't know you were still using a Yeti. I'm not trying to say But that is really out. funny. That is actually really <laughs> funny. So for people listening, I think you can make the best of whatever you've got. But the main tip is having a microphone is better than nothing because, you know, how many people come on and don't even have a a separate mic. They're just talking to the computer. The other thing I would say is earbuds so you can separate the input and the output because that is the worst kind of annoyance I find. Absolutely. And it also reduces echoes. Having headphones or earbuds is critical. And this actually really illustrates a good point. You don't care the microphone that Joanna is using. You care that what she has to say is useful and helpful, right? She's useful and helpful every week. And so you keep listening. And that really is the most important thing. Yes, a different microphone, less room noise or whatever might help a little bit. But if you're not useful and helpful, it doesn't help at all, right? You Mm -hmm. have to thrill the audience. That's the first most important thing, both as a host and as a guest. And so if you can convince somebody that you've got the information or the story that will really thrill their audience, they may put up with you not having a good microphone, but have something. Don't talk into your laptop (laughs) Uh, because your laptop microphone is really bad. Yeah, no, exactly. And the other thing that I've sometimes found is that people will be hesitant about sharing aspects of their book. Obviously, if you're talking about a novel, you don't want to do any spoilers. But I always have the attitude, you have to give as much away as possible in order to give value. And then if people are interested, they will go buy the book, right? Yeah, there's this view that if you blog your book ahead of time, people won't want to buy the book. And that's like saying, oh, if you release the story of the movie as a book first, people won't want to go watch the movie because they already know how it ends. And you're like, that's crazy. (laughs) The people in line at midnight for the movie are the people who already read the book for the movie, right? I was at the midnight showing for Lord of the Rings, not because... I wanted to know how the movie ended, but because I knew how the movie ended, and I wanted to be there <laughs> for the movie. And so, yes, giving people a sample, the experience of reading something on a screen or listening to something on a podcast and then reading it in a paper book is very different. It, Brandon Sanderson's first Kickstarter campaign, the one that raised six or seven million dollars, was for a book everyone had already read. It was the 10th (laughs) anniversary edition for $250. No one was backing that Kickstarter campaign to find out how Way of Kings ended. They were backing it because they already owned Way of Kings. They bought the cheap paperback. It was split in the middle several times because they'd read it two or three times. And the idea of having a nice leatherback copy was appealing. And yes, I'm willing to spend $250 $250 for a nice copy of a book I already own. And so if you thrill people with your story, they'll want to buy it in multiple formats. Mm, for sure. Oh, I think we could talk forever, but we're out of time. So <laughs> where can people find you and Author Media and your podcasts and everything you do online? So you can search in your podcast app, the one you're using right now for novel marketing and the novel marketing podcast will come up. And then if you want to listen to my podcast, Christian Publishing Show, just do a search for Christian Publishing Show. You can also find them at novelmarketing.com and christianpublishingshow.com. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time, Thomas. That was great. Thanks for having me. So I hope you found the discussion with Thomas interesting and that you've got some tips for your book marketing. And if you want more detail on pitching podcasts, being a good guest and much more, check out my book, Audio for Authors, Audiobooks, Podcasting and Voice Technologies, available on my store, creativepenbooks.com and on all the usual online bookstores. So next week, I'm talking to Damon Courtney from Book Funnel about all the fantastic ways that Book Funnel can help authors. Now, I have been using Book Funnel for years, pretty much since it started, and I do not use all the functions. And recently, I was I emailed and said, hey, I want to sell more bundles, but I don't want to have to create one digital file. Can you do that? And that is just one of the standard things they offer. Uh, you can deliver multiple files with one sale uh, through Shopify or WooCommerce or whatever. And 
And I was like, oh my goodness, that's super useful. Why didn't I know that before? So there's lots of things I didn't know about Book Funnel and uh, I would like to know more. <laughs> so I, Damon's coming back on the show uh, and it's useful however you publish because many authors use Book Funnel to deliver free books for their email lists, but there's lots more you can do with it. So yeah, lots of tips from Damon coming next week. In the meantime, happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.